let's say a word about dreams. We all have thoughts which we never knew we had. They are too uncomfortable, too incompatible with our adult self to be remembered. Yet they are often disturbing, rumbling under the surface like lava in a volcano. The dream is the royal road to these thoughts, the royal road to the unconscious. This is the story of how Sigmund Freud's ideas about the unconscious mind were used by those in power in post-war America to try and control the masses. Politicians and planners came to believe that Freud was right to suggest that hidden deep within all human beings were dangerous and irrational desires and fears. They were convinced that it was the unleashing of these instincts that had led to the barbarism of Nazi Germany. To stop it ever happening again, they set out to find ways to control this hidden enemy within the human mind. At the heart of the story are Sigmund Freud's daughter, Anna, and his nephew, Edward Bernays, who had invented the profession of public relations. Their ideas were used by the US government, big business, and the CIA to develop techniques to manage and control the minds of the American people. Those in power believed that the only way to make democracy work and create a stable society was to repress the savage barbarism that lurked just under the surface of normal American life. The story begins in the middle of the fierce fighting of the Second World War. As the fighting intensified, the American army was faced by an extraordinary number of mental breakdowns among its troops. 49% of all soldiers evacuated from combat were sent back because they suffered from mental problems. In desperation, the army turned to the new ideas of psychoanalysis. They made a film record of the experiment using hidden cameras. It says here on your record that uh, you had headaches and that you had crying spells. Yes, sir. Uh, I believe in your profession is called nostalgia. In other words, homesickness. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. It was induced when shortly before the war. I received a picture of my sweetheart. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I can't go to you. That's all right. It was the first time that anyone had paid such attention to the feelings and anxieties of ordinary people. At the heart of the experiment were a number of refugee psychoanalysts from Central Europe. They worked with American psychiatrists to guide and shape the project. When I first came to America, I worked in the psychiatric service with soldiers trying to rehabilitate them. And I traveled in the train from the East Coast to the West Coast, I was enormously curious what goes on in all of those little towns that the train is passing. After my years in the army, I knew exactly what everybody was doing in the little towns. Because I, I saw so many people who came from there and I understood their aspirations, their disappointments and so forth. So, it was as if somebody invited me to a privileged tour in the, into the inner soul of America. I'm not doing this deliberately, so of please believe me. I, I, I do believe you. Um, a display of emotion is sometimes very helpful. Yeah, I hope so, sir. Sure, it gets it off the chest. Well, sir, to be perfectly honest with you, I'm very much in love with my sweetheart. She has been the one person that gave me a sense of importance is that through her cooperation with me, we were able to surmount so many obstacles. Take it easy now, just talk to you. The psychoanalysts used techniques developed by Freud to take the men back into their past. They became convinced that the breakdowns were not the direct result of fighting. The stress of combat had merely triggered old childhood memories. 
These were memories of the men's own violent feelings and desires, which they had repressed because they were too frightening. Think deeply. Let's go back. When was it to the psychoanalysts, it was overwhelming proof of Freud's theory that underneath human beings were driven by primitive, irrational forces. You want that? World War II was a major shattering experience because I discovered the enormous role of the irrational in the lives of most people. Yeah, that I can say, that I learned, that, that the, the ratio between the irrational and the rational in America is very much in favor of the irrational, that there is much greater unhappiness much more suffering, much more. A, a, a sadder country than one would imagine it from, from, the adverti from the advertisements that you get. A much more problematic country. Victory in the Second World War was celebrated as a triumph of democracy. But in private, many policymakers were worried about the implications of the analysis of the soldiers. It seemed to show that underneath every American were irrational, violent drives. What had happened in Germany seemed to bear this out. The complicity of so many ordinary Germans in mass killings during the war showed just how easily these forces could break through and overwhelm democracy. Planners and policymakers had been convinced by their experiences during World War II that human beings could act very irrationally because of this sort of teeming and raw and unpredictable emotionality, um, the, the kind of chaos that lived at the, at the, at the base of human personality could, uh, in fact, infect the society, social institutions, to such a point that the society itself would become sick. That's what they believe happened in Germany, in which the irrational, the anti-democratic, went wild. It was a vision of, of human nature as incredibly destructive, and they were terrified that Americans would in fact behave that way, or were capable of behaving that way, and they wanted to avoid a rerun of that. So what is needed is a human being that can internalize democratic values so that they are not shaken with the storm. And psychoanalysis carried in it the promise that it can be done. It opened up new vistas as to how the inner structure of the human being can be changed so that he becomes a more vital, free, supporter and maintainer of democracy. The psychoanalysts were convinced they not only understood these dangerous forces, but they knew how to control them too. They would use their techniques to create democratic individuals, because democracy left to itself failed to do this. The source of this idea was not only Sigmund Freud, but his youngest daughter, Anna. She had fled with her father to London before the outbreak of war. And after he died, Anna Freud became the acknowledged leader of the world psychoanalytic movement. She saw her job as to fulfill her father's dream of making his ideas accepted throughout the world. At the center of the Freud movement stood Tante Anna because she managed to work herself into that position. She was recognized as that and not just because she was a daughter. She worked, she worked on that. She was rather forbidding. She was not, to me, a warm person, not an aunt you could, you could kiss or put your arms around. Not at all. And her whole life rotated around the spreading of psychoanalysis. Freud himself had seen the role of psychoanalysis as allowing people to understand their unconscious drives. But Anna Freud believed it was possible to teach individuals how to control these inner forces. She had come to believe this through analyzing children, above all the children of her close friend, Dorothy Burlingham. <laughs> 
Dorothy Burlingham was an American millionaires who in the 1920s fled a failed marriage and brought her children to Anna Freud in Vienna. They were suffering terrible anxieties and aggression. But Anna Freud was convinced she could free them from this by changing the world around them. She thought that she could come in and um, into their environment, essentially, because they were children, you see. They didn't have independent lives of their own. She could go talk to the parents or the mother. Uh, she could go to the schools. She could influence their real world, the actual external world, to change their lives and to, uh, to help them. And to change them as people? I think that was uh, part of what uh, her idea was, is that she felt that she could change them. From her analysis of the Burlingham children, Anna Freud developed a theory of how to help them control their inner drives. She believed that if, as well as psychotherapy, they were also encouraged to adapt to a good family and social environment, then the conscious part of their mind, the ego, would be strengthened in its struggle to control the unconscious. Anna Freud's aim was simply to help the children. But it was always the psychoanalyst who decided what was the right environment and the appropriate behaviour for the children. And often as not, this reflected the social mores of the time. In my father's uh, case, they were uh, concerned that he would be a homosexual. And so a lot of their efforts went into uh, preventing or trying to stop my father from becoming a homosexual. Whether or not he would have or did or, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's unknown to me. Why did they want to stop him? Because they felt it was abnormal. It wasn't a, uh, it wasn't a normal uh, way to develop. They wanted to have him develop a, a, along lines that society recognized to be normal because if they didn't, then you're going to be under the control of forces that you don't understand, that you're not even aware of. The analysis seemed to be a great success, and in the 30s, the Burlingham children had returned to America. They settled down to happy married lives in the suburbs. What they didn't realize was that their experience was about to become a template for a giant social experiment to control the inner mental life of the American population. In 1946, President Truman signed the National Mental Health Act. It had been born directly out of the wartime discoveries by psychoanalysts that millions of Americans who had been drafted suffered hidden anxieties and fears. The aim of the act was to deal with this invisible threat to society. Shocked by the appalling percentage of the emotionally unstable revealed by the World War II draft figures, Congress in 1946 passed the National Mental Health Act, which recognized for the first time that mental illness was a national problem. Keenly aware of the tremendous problems ahead is Dr. Robert H. Felix, director of the vast new project. A primary objective of the National Mental Health Program is to increase our fund of scientific knowledge about mental health and about mental illness. We're not doing this. Why? Because there are all too few skilled mental health workers. Two of the principal architects of the act were the Menninger brothers, Carl and Will. Will had run the wartime psychotherapy experiments, and now he and his brother began to train hundreds of new psychiatrists. The Menningers were convinced that it would be possible to apply Anna Freud's ideas on a wide scale and to adults as well as children. The psychiatrist's job would be to teach ordinary Americans how to control their unconscious drives. Psychoanalysis could be used to make a better society. They said psychoanalytic thinking could make for the betterment of society because you could change the way the mind functioned and you could take the ways in which people did hurtful things to themselves and others and alter them by enlarging their understanding. And this was the vision psychoanalysis brought. That you could really change people. That you could really change people. And you could change them almost in limitless ways. In the late 40s, a vast project began in America to apply the ideas of psychoanalysis to the masses. Psychological guidance centers were set up in hundreds of towns, 
they were staffed by psychiatrists who believed it was their job to control the hidden forces inside the minds of millions of ordinary Americans. Yes, I, I, I need something done. I, I need some help. I... Mm -hmm. Did you have any particular teachers that you liked? Any sort? I liked all my teachers except one, I remember. Well, what was the trouble with this one? I don't know, she just scared me most of the time. Holler at me and I'd run outside and vomit. I hate my brother. Loathe him. Despise him. At the same time, thousands of counselors were trained to apply psychoanalysis to marriage guidance. And social workers were sent out to visit people's homes and advise on the psychological structure of family life. Behind all this was the fundamental idea of Anna Freud's, that if people were encouraged to conform to the accepted patterns of family and social life, then their ego would be strengthened. They would be able to control the dangerous forces within them. When your emotions control your actions, it affects not only yourself, but the people around you. And if this sort of flare-up is repeated often, it might lead to a permanently warped personality. You can control the fire of your emotions so that your personality becomes more pleasant. So we expect that someone who's been through that experience will be much more insightful, much more understanding, and a much better regulated person. And what happens to the dog? And regulation includes being able to let go, as it were, to enjoy a football game or a soccer game. A more understanding, yes, rational, but also appropriately emotional person. The regulatory aspects of the human mind would really be in charge. Instead of? Instead of being overwhelmed by our passions and by our darker impulses that one would be master or mistress of one's own passions. They just felt that the road to happiness was in adapting to the external world in which they lived. That people could be uncrippled from their own neurotic conflicts and impulses, that they would not engage in self-destructive behavior, that they would in fact adapt to the reality about them. They never questioned the reality they never questioned that it might itself be a source of evil or something to which you could not adapt without, uh, without compromise or without suffering or without exploiting yourself in some way. So there was this fit with the politics of the day. And a balance of emotions is important to a well-rounded personality. But it was only the beginning of the rise to power of psychoanalysis in America. Psychoanalysts were about to move into big business and use their techniques not just to create model citizens, but model consumers. Last week's episode showed how Freud's American nephew, Edward Bernays, had been the first to convince American corporations that they could sell products by connecting them with people's unconscious feelings. But now, a group of psychoanalysts were going to take what Bernays had begun and invent a whole range of techniques to get inside and manage the unconscious mind of the consumer. They were led by Ernest Dichter. Dichter had practiced next door to Freud in Vienna, but he had come to America and set up the Institute for Motivational Research in an old mansion north of New York. This is the Institute for Motivational Research a place devoted to the intriguing business of finding out why people behave as they do, why they buy as they do, why they respond to advertising as they do. And this is Dr. Ernest Dichter. We don't go out and ask directly, uh, why do you buy, why don't you? What we try to do instead is to understand the total personality, the self-image of the customer. We use all the resources of modern social sciences. It opens up some stimulating psychological techniques for selling any new product. Like the other psychoanalysts, Dichter believed that American citizens were fundamentally irrational beings. They could not be trusted. Their real reasons for buying products were rooted in unconscious desires and feelings. And Dichter wanted to find ways to uncover what he called the secret self of the American consumer. 
he was trying to get out of people's mind the unconscious motivations that they had for purchasing. Uh, these could be sexual, they could be psychological, they could be sociological, they could be a demand for status, a demand for recognition. There were things that people couldn't verbalize or wouldn't verbalize because they were too secret to them. They were too much a part of their nature and they, were, they would be embarrassed. They would be embarrassed if they came out and said things like this. He would interview people, but not ask them direct questions, but let them talk freely like you do in psychoanalysis. And that was his background. And so he said, why can't we have a group therapy session about products? All right? And so Dichter built this room up above his garage, and he said, we can have psychoanalysis of products. They can actually act out and verbalize their wants and needs. What we're going to do is try a couple of these uh, salad dressings. Now let's see what happens. Here is our typical housewife. She doesn't follow the instructions. And they could be observed and watched, and other people could comment, and they could talk about it, and everybody could join in. He was the first to do this. This was absolutely the first thing that was ever done. And he had a movie projector up there where you could show advertisements and things like that, and people could react to them. And he invented the whole technique for mining the unconscious about the hidden psychological wants that people had about products. This became the focus group. It worked! Victor's breakthrough came with a focus group study he did for Betty Crocker Foods. Like many food manufacturers in the early 50s, they had invented a new range of instant convenience foods. But although consumers had told market researchers they would welcome the idea, in fact, they were refusing to buy them. The worst problem was the Betty Crocker cake mix. Dicta did a series of focus groups where housewives free associated about the cake mix. He concluded that they felt unconscious guilt at the new image being promoted of ease and convenience. In other words, he understood that the barrier to the consumption of the product was the housewife's feeling of guilt about using it. They basically, on one hand, wanted to make it easy for themselves, but they felt guilty about it. So what you've got to do in those circumstances is remove the barrier, the barrier being guilt. The way you do that is to give the housewife a greater sense of participation. And how do you do that? By adding an egg. Simple as that? As simple as that. Dicta told Betty Crocker to put an instruction on the packet that the housewife should add an egg. It would be an unconscious symbol, he said, of the housewife mixing in her own eggs as a gift to her husband, and so would lessen the guilt. Betty Crocker did it, and the sales soared. My cake is ready. The consumer may have basic needs that the consumer himself or herself doesn't fully understand. You have to know what those needs are in order to fully exploit the consumer. Is it wrong to give people what they want by taking away their defenses, helping re remove their defenses? It seems so much longer than last year. It is. Nearly four inches longer in some models. Oh! Dicta's success led to a rush by corporations and advertising agencies to employ psychoanalysts. They became known as the Depth Boys, and they promised to show companies how to make millions by connecting their products with people's hidden desires. Dicta himself became a millionaire, famous for inventing slogans like, a tiger in your tank. Even the marketing of the Barbie doll came from a children's focus group. And so it goes. <laughs> But Dichter was convinced that this was far more than just selling. Like Anna Freud, he believed that the environment could be used to strengthen the human personality. And products had the power both to sate inner desires and give people a feeling of common identity with those around them. It was a strategy for creating a stable society. Dichter called it the strategy of desire. To understand a stable citizen, 
you have to know that modern man quite often tries to work off his frustrations by spending on self-gratification. Modern man is eternally ready to fill out his self-image by purchasing products which complement it. If you identify yourself with a product, it can have a therapeutic value. It improves your self-image and you become a more secure person and you have suddenly this confidence of going out in the world and doing what you want successfully. Bernard believed that that would then improve the whole of our society and become the best society on this planet. By the early 50s, the ideas of psychoanalysis had penetrated deep into American life. The psychoanalysts themselves became rich and powerful. Many had consulting rooms overlooking Central Park in New York. Politicians and famous writers like Arthur Miller and Tennessee Williams became their patients. They were seeking not just help, but to understand the hidden roots of human behavior. We were sought after. Washington was interested in what we think. You know, the, the important, important writers, important politicians were undergoing psychoanalysis. It was, we had, we had waiting lists because there were so many patients that wanted to be analyzed. So it, it gave us a little bit of a swellhead. And as the psychoanalyst's ideas took hold in America, a new elite began to emerge in politics, social planning, and in business. What linked this elite was the assumption that the masses were fundamentally irrational. To make a free market democracy like America work, one had to use psychological techniques to control mass irrationality. They actually believed that this elite was necessary because individual citizens were not capable, if left alone, of being democratic citizens. The elite was necessary in order to create the conditions that would produce individuals capable of behaving as a, uh, a good consumer and also behaving as a democratic citizen. They didn't see uh, their activities as anti-democratic, as undermining the capacity of individual citizens for democracy, quite the opposite. They understood that they were creating uh, the conditions for uh, democracy's survival and future. Anna Freud had never intended that her ideas be used in such a way, but she happily accepted the rise to power of psychoanalysis in America. She remained in England, living with Dorothy Burlingham. On the surface, it was an idyllic life. She and Dorothy had bought a weekend cottage on the Suffolk coast. And in the summers, Dorothy's children came from America to visit with the grandchildren. But underneath, things were going badly wrong. Both Bob and Mabby Burlingham, who Anna Freud had analyzed in the 1930s, had suffered personal breakdowns and their marriages were collapsing. Bob was drinking heavily and Mabby suffered terrible anxieties. The real reasons for the visits to England were yet more analysis with Anna Freud. Well, the problem was that it didn't look very good, did it? Because here you have somebody who's having nervous breakdowns and uh, is, is uh, having alcoholic binges. And uh, this is not exactly, <laughs> doesn't really sit well. Um, well, you know, from a humane standpoint, obviously this is not desirable, you know, you want to help these people, but it also had the wider ramifications of everybody in, in, in analysis, in analytic circles, knew that Bob and Mabby were uh, guinea pigs. They were the living proof that this was a wonderful process. It was very much swept under the rug. It really it didn't get out. I mean, these people had such, uh, their, their power and influence was such uh, that, you know, you were very careful. Anna Freud was a very powerful person, and um, you were the grandchildren, and uh, she knew a great deal more than you did about what went on in your parents' lives and so forth. It was not something you were going to tangle with, and you were a product of the whole situation. Uh, but at the same time, we all knew that something was really out of whack. <laughs> 
as she grew older, she became more and more important, didn't she? Politically and scientifically, but she didn't know when to stop. She was a bit too righteous. Uh, what she did was always the thing, and she would never, to my, my knowledge, acknowledge that she could make a mistake or be wrong. That is my feeling. But the power and influence of the Freud family in America was about to grow even more. Politicians were about to turn to Anna Freud's cousin, Edward Bernays, for help in a time of crisis. He was going to manipulate the inner feelings and fears of the masses to help America's politicians fight the Cold War. I don't mean to say, and no one can say to you, that there are no dangers. Of course there are risks if we are not vigilant. But we do not have to be hysterical. In 1953, the Soviet Union exploded its first hydrogen bomb, and the fear of nuclear war and communism gripped the United States. Those in power became concerned about how to reassure the population. Committees were set up and public information films made, appealing for calm in the face of new threats, like nuclear fallout. It's the fallacy of devoting 85% of one's worrying capacity to an agent that constitutes only about 15% of an atomic bomb's destroying potential. At this point, Edward Bernays was living in New York. In the 1920s, he had invented the profession of public relations and was now one of the most powerful PR men in America. He worked for most of the major corporations and advised politicians, including President Eisenhower. Like his uncle Sigmund, Bernays was convinced that human beings were driven by irrational forces. The only way to deal with the public was to connect with their unconscious desires and fears. Bernays argued that instead of trying to reduce people's fear of communism, one should actually encourage and manipulate the fear, but in such a way as it became a weapon in the Cold War. Rational argument was fruitless. What my father understood about groups is that they are manipulable, they're malleable, and that, that you can tap into their deepest desires or their deepest fears and use that to your own purposes. I don't think he felt that all those publics out there had reliable judgment, that they very easily might vote for the wrong man or want the wrong thing so that they had to be guided from above. One of Bernays' main clients was the giant United Fruit Company. They owned vast banana plantations in Guatemala in Central America. For decades, United Fruit had controlled the country through pliable dictators. It was known as a banana republic. But in 1950, a young officer, Colonel Arbenz, was elected president. He promised to remove United Fruit's control over the country. And in 1953, he announced the government would take over much of their land. It was a massively popular move, but a disaster for United Fruit. And they turned to Bernays to help get rid of our Benz. United Fruit brings in Bernays, and he basically understood that what United Fruit Company had to do was change this from being a popularly elected government that was doing some things that were good for the people there into this being very close to the American shore, a threat to American democracy, that it being at a time in the Cold War when Americans responded to issues of the Red Scare and what communism might do, he was trying to transform this and brilliantly did transform it into an issue of a communist threat very close to our shores, taking United Fruit again as a commercial client out of the picture and making it look like a question of American democracy, American values being threatened. In reality, R. Benz was a democratic socialist with no links to Moscow. But Bernays set out to turn him into a communist threat to America. He organized a trip to Guatemala for influential American journalists. Few of them knew anything about the country or its politics. Bernays arranged for them to be entertained and to meet selected Guatemalan politicians who told them that Arbenz was a communist controlled by Moscow. During the trip, there was also a violent anti-American demonstration in the capital. Many of those who worked for United Fruit were convinced it had been organized by Bernays himself. <laughs> 
He also created a fake independent news agency in America called the Middle American Information Bureau. It bombarded the American media with press releases saying that Moscow was planning to use Guatemala as a beachhead to attack America. All of this had the desired effect. In Guatemala, the Jacob R. Benz regime became increasingly communistic after its inauguration in 1951. Communists in the Congress and high governmental positions controlled major committees, labor and farm groups, and propaganda facilities. They agitated and led in demonstrations against neighboring countries and the United States. What was profoundly new in terms of what Bernays did is he took this menace to our backyard in Guatemala. For the first time, we saw Reds a couple hundred miles from uh, New Orleans who Eddie Bernays had us believing were a true threat to us, that it was going to be a Soviet outpost in our backyard. But what Bernays was doing was not just trying to blacken the Arbenz regime. He was part of a secret plot. President Eisenhower had agreed that America should topple the Arbenz government, but secretly. The CIA were instructed to organize a coup. Working with the United Fruit Company, the CIA trained and armed a rebel army and found a new leader for the country called Colonel Armas. The CIA agent in charge was Howard Hunt, later one of the Watergate burglars. What we wanted to do was have a terror campaign uh, to terrify our bench particularly, terrify his, his troops, much as the German Stuka bombers terrified the population of, of uh, Holland, uh, Belgium, and, uh, and Poland at the onset of World War II, and just rendered everybody paralyzed. As planes flown by CIA pilots dropped bombs on Guatemala City, Edward Bernays carried on his propaganda campaign in the American press. He was preparing the American population to see this as the liberation of Guatemala by freedom fighters for democracy. He totally understood that the coup would happen when the public and the press, when conditions in the public and the press allowed for a coup to happen and he created those conditions. He was totally savvy in terms of just what he was helping create there in terms of this overthrow. But ultimately he was reshaping reality, uh, reshaping public opinion in a way that's undemocratic and manipulative. On June the 27th, 1954, Colonel Arbenz fled the country and Armas arrived as the new leader. Within months, Vice President Nixon visited Guatemala. In an event staged by United Fruit's PR department, he was shown piles of Marxist literature that had been found, it was said, in the presidential palace. This is the first time in the history of the world that the communist government has been overthrown by the people. And for that, we congratulate you and the people of Guatemala for the support they have given. And we are sure that under your leadership, supported by the people whom I have met by the hundreds on my visit to Guatemala, that Guatemala is going to enter a new era in which there will be prosperity for the people together with liberty for the people. Thank you very much for allowing us to see this exhibit of communism in Guatemala. You're welcome. And for dinner, see what mother has for dessert, banana gingerbread shortcake. Just another of the many tempting ways in which this nutritious fruit can be prepared. So now that you've seen where bananas come from before they reach your table, our journey to banana land has ended. We hope you enjoyed the trip. We know you like bananas. Bernays had manipulated the American people, but he had done so because he, like many others at the time, believed that the interests of business and the interests of America were indivisible, especially when faced with the threat of communism. But Bernays was convinced that to explain this rationally to the American people was impossible, because they were not rational. Instead, one had to touch on their inner fears and manipulate them in the interests of a higher truth. He called it the engineering of consent. He was doing it for uh, the American way of life, and w to which he was devoted, uh, so this sincerely devoted. And yet, he felt the people were really pretty stupid. And that's the paradox. If you don't leave it up to the people themselves, but force them to 
choose what you want them to choose, however subtly, uh, then it's not democracy anymore. It's something else. It's being told what to do. It's being, it's, it's, it's that old authoritarian thing. But the idea that it was necessary to manipulate the inner feelings of the American population in the interests of fighting the Cold War now began to take root in Washington. Above all, in the CIA, who were going to take it much further. They were concerned that the Soviets were experimenting with psychological methods to actually alter the memories and feelings of people, the aim being to produce more controllable citizens. It was known as brainwashing. Psychologists in the CIA were convinced that this really might be possible and that they should try to do it themselves. The image of the human being that was being built up at that particular time was that there was a great deal of vulnerability in every human being and that that vulnerability could be manipulated to program somebody to be something that I wanted them to be and they didn't want to be. That you could manipulate people in such a way that they could be automatons, if you will, for whatever your own purposes were. This was the image that people thought was possible. In the late 50s, the CIA poured millions of dollars into the psychology departments of universities across America. They were secretly funding experiments on how to alter and control the inner drives of human beings. The most notorious of these experiments was run by the head of the American Psychiatric Association, Dr. Ewan Cameron. Like many psychiatrists at that time, Cameron was convinced that inside human beings were dangerous forces which threatened society. But he believed that it was possible not just to control these forces, but actually remove them. He thought that psychiatry should not just concentrate on sick people, mentally ill, but should actually go into government, that politicians should listen to psychiatrists, psychiatrists should be in every parliament and should direct and monitor political activities because they knew in a rational, scientific way what was good for people. Cameron had set up a clinic in a hospital in Montreal called the Allen Memorial. It is now long since closed down. Cameron took patients who suffered a wide range of mental problems. His theory was that these resulted from forgotten or oppressed memories. But he was impatient with the idea of using psychotherapy to uncover them. Instead, he would simply wipe them. Cameron used drugs, including LSD, and the technique of ECT, electroconvulsive therapy. It was conventionally used at that time to relieve depression. But Cameron was going to use it in a new way, to produce new people. He was really using it to try and um, change the fundamental function of the individual, to um, alter their past memories, their past ways of behaving, uh, and as, as I think he, he said at one point, it is to just sort of erase everything from their past so that you then had a slate in which you could record new ways of behavior. Uh, and so he used massive doses of shock, of people receiving several shocks a day, uh, uh, and over a course, of, a course of time, hundreds of ECT uh, treatments, so that they were just reduced to a, a sort of a very primitive vegetable state. I don't remember what happened to me. Um, I was introduced to Dr. Cameron, and I don't remember Dr. Cameron at all. I don't remember any of that. They shipped me up to what they called the sleep room, and they gave me all of these electro convulsive shock treatments and mega doses of drugs and LSD and all of that and I have no memory of any of that. N nothing in the, in, of, of that time in the Allen Memorial or, or any of my life previous to that, all gone, wiped. And then having depatterned 
somebody or brought them down to where basically uh, nothing but the essential functions of, of the body were going on in terms of breathing and things of this nature. Then he would begin to feed material into these individuals, positive material, such that the brain would be programmed in a positive way so that the individual would be completely altered. Then he put these tapes under our pillows called psychic driving. He would, he would then put back into this empty brain uh, a program of whatever sort he decided upon uh, and the people like myself would e e wake up another person, I guess. In fact, Cameron's experiments were a complete disaster. All he managed to produce were dozens of individuals with memory loss and the ability to repeat the phrase, I am at ease with myself. And it was not an isolated case. Almost all the experiments the CIA funded were equally unsuccessful. Despite their ambitions, American psychologists were beginning to find out how difficult it was to understand and control the inner workings of the human mind. We had been really chasing a phantom, if you will, an illusion, that the human mind was more capable of manipulation from the outside by outside factors than it is. We found out that the human being is an extremely complex thing. There were no simple solutions. But you've just got to bear in mind that these were very strange times. The psychoanalysts had come to power in America because of their theory that they knew how to control the dangerous forces inside human beings. But now the psychoanalysts were about to face a high-profile failure that would lead people to begin questioning the very basis of their ideas. It began in Hollywood. The film industry had become fascinated by psychoanalysis and Anna Freud was a powerful influence on dozens of analysts in Los Angeles. They treated film stars, directors and studio bosses. Anna Freud's closest friend was the most sought after of all, Ralph Greenson. And in 1960, the most famous star in the world turned to Greenson for help. Marilyn Monroe was suffering from despair and had become addicted to alcohol and drugs. Well, when I walked in to dinner, here was Marilyn Monroe. And I'd made a picture with her called All About Eve. This is dinner at Ralph Greenson's? Yes. And the only thing was that Ralph was trying to show her, Romy, I never called him Ralph in my life, Romy was trying to show her that uh, the way a family life ought really to be. So we were walking the dog after us. I said, what the hell are you doing here? I said, you never asked me to dinner. And he said, you weren't that sick. And I said, oh. No, he said, the point is just this child has no, no frame of reference. She, in other words, she doesn't know where she, what the goal is. What Greenson did was follow Anna Freud's theory. If Marilyn Monroe could be taught to conform to what society considered a normal pattern of life, that would help her ego control her inner destructive urges. But Greenson pushed it to an extreme. He persuaded Monroe to move into a house nearby that was decorated like his own. He then took her into his own family life, and he, his wife and his daughter played at being Monroe's own family. Greenson himself would become the model of conformity. And so this, someone whom she regarded as important and uh, whom she idealized, if he turned out to be a very gratifying father figure, she, her ego would benefit from that. That was the theory. His wife and children, everyone was involved in. They were strengthening the person. They were strengthening the mind. They were strengthening the agent that controls inner life against adversity, against insufficiency, against too much frustration. So that Marilyn Monroe would no longer be a helpless person 
looking for love. She'd have enough love. But despite all his efforts, Greenson was unable to help Marilyn Monroe. On August the 5th, 1962, she committed suicide in her house. The suicide shocked many in the analytic community, including Anna Freud. And high-profile figures in American life, who had previously been enthusiasts for psychoanalysis, now began to question why psychoanalysis had become so powerful in America. Was it really because it benefited individuals? Or had it in fact become a form of constraint in the interests of social order? The critics included Monroe's ex-husband, Arthur Miller. My argument with so much psychoanalysis is the preconception that suffering is a mistake or a sign of weakness or a sign even of illness, when in fact, possibly the greatest truths we know have come out of people's suffering. That the problem is not to undo suffering or to wipe it off the face of the earth, but to make it inform our lives instead of trying to cure ourselves of it constantly and avoid it and avoid anything but that lobotomized sense of what they call happiness. There's too much of an attempt, it seems to me, to think in terms of controlling man rather than freeing him, of, of uh, defining him rather than, uh, than, than uh, letting him go. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's part of the whole ideology of this age, which is power mad. <laughs> It flashed on a screen too quick to see. But still you get it subliminally. At the same time, an onslaught was launched on the way psychoanalysis was being used by business to control people. The first blow came with a bestseller, The Hidden Persuaders, written by Vance Packard. It accused psychoanalysts of reducing the American people to emotional puppets, whose only function was to keep the mass production lines running. They did this by manipulating people's unconscious desires to create longings for ever new brands and models. They had turned the population into unwitting participants in the system of planned obsolescence. The second blow came from an influential philosopher and social critic, Herbert Marcuse. He had been trained in psychoanalysis. This is a childish uh, application of psychoanalysis uh, which does not take at all into consider consideration uh, the uh, very real uh, political systematic waste of resources of technology and of the productive process. Uh, for example, plant obsolescence. For example, the production of innumerable brands and gadgets who are uh, in the last analysis all the same the uh, production of uh, innumerable uh, different uh, marks of automobiles and this prosperity at the same time consciously or unconsciously uh, leads to a kind of schizophrenic uh, existence i believe that in this society an incredible uh, quantum of aggressiveness and destructiveness is accumulated precisely because of the empty prosperity uh, which then uh, simply erupts. Marcuse's argument was not simply that psychoanalysis had been used for corrupt purposes, it was more fundamental. Marcuse said that the very idea that you needed to control people was wrong. Human beings did have inner emotional drives, but they were not inherently violent or evil. It was society that made these drives dangerous by repressing and distorting them. Anna Freud and her followers had increased that repression by trying to make people conform to society. In so doing, they made people more dangerous, not less. Marcuse challenged that social world and he said that's a world that should not be adapted to. And in fact, what the individual was adapting to was corrupt and evil and corrupting. In other words, he switched, he switched the source of evil from inward conflict to the society itself. That the sickness of society lay at the societal level, not at the sickness of human beings in it. <laughs> 
And if people did not challenge that, then they were, in fact, submitting to evil. Modern psychology has a word that is probably used more than any other word in psychology. It is the word maladjusted. It is the ring and cry of modern child psychology, maladjusted. Now, of course, we all want to live the well-adjusted life in order to avoid neurotic and schizophrenic personalities. But as I move toward my conclusion, I would like to say to you today, in a very honest manner, that there are some things in our society and some things in our world for which I'm proud to be maladjusted. And I call upon all men of goodwill to be maladjusted to these things until the good society is realized. I must honestly say to you that I never intend to adjust myself to racial segregation and discrimination. I never intend to adjust myself to religious bigotry. I never intend to adjust myself to economic conditions that will take necessities from the many to give luxuries to the few and leave millions of God's children smothering in an airtight cage of poverty in the midst of an affluent society. The political influence of the Freudian psychoanalysts was over. Instead, they were now accused of having helped to create a repressive form of social control. Anna Freud and Dorothy Burlingham lived on in Sigmund Freud's old house in London. In 1970, Dorothy's son Bob died of alcoholism. And in 1973, his sister Mabby returned for yet more analysis with Anna Freud. She went back for more analysis. She was living in, uh, in at 20 Marisville Gardens in the Freud house, uh, as I guess she did when she wasn't with her husband. And uh, she committed suicide. She took an overdose of sleeping pills. In Freud's own house? In Freud's own house, right. So, I mean, you know, the obvious, uh, there are a lot of, implications that one can draw from that, and uh, I just think she, she happened to reach the end of the rope there. Although uh, it would seem to be a very pointed um, uh, act. Um, obviously suicide is a very politicized act, and to do it uh, in Sigmund Freud's own house is, uh, is um, certainly different from doing it in Riverdale back in New York. Next week's episode will tell the story of the rise to power of the enemies of the Freud family. They believed that the way to build a better society was to let the self free. But what they didn't realize was that this idea of liberation would provide business and politics with yet another way to control the self by feeding its infinite desires. You know not what it means to be blue. Someday you'll realize and pay for all those lies Then you'll know what it means to be blue